event it's a process you know most christians think they are in the kingdom they are in the kingdom but not in god's kingdom they are in a god stuck in a religion jesus did not come to establish a religion he came he is not the founder of christianity jesus came with the kingdom message and we turned it into a religion and denomination instead of king building kingdom nation we have been building denominations so that's what happened to us so holly i can hear you your mic is muted are you saying something or are you speaking in tongues <laughs> you're like hana you know you're in the temple your lip is moving but i can hear you <laughs> Hi Amy, welcome. Hi Charis, welcome. Yeah, your mic is still muted. Hi, thank you. How is everything? How is everything in Dominica? It's going well. Going well. How is the Kingdom School classes? I don't hear much from you guys. You <laughs> They're going great. It's good to be here. Good to receive the teaching. It's really enlightening, life changing. Good, good. Well, you guys are young, so you can get this when you are young. Life would be much better when you become 40. <laughs> you can get this when you're in 20, you know. But when you get if you get this when you are in 40, then we have to work double hard to transition from all the nonsense we learned. Uh, Ambassador Samuel, welcome. Thank you very much, Apostle. Yes. How are you? I'm doing very well. And you? Good. Excellent. So, Holly, I didn't hear you. Are you still trying to say something or are we going to wait? What's your definition of Christianity? Christianity is a religion. That's what world is recognizing Christianity as a religion, you know, like Islam, Hinduism. Jesus didn't come to establish a religion or he's not the founder of, founder of Christianity. He came with one message, kingdom, morning till evening, from the beginning till the end. Is the way considered a religion? When the New Testament the disciples called themselves of the way? No, that's not a religion way. Jesus is the way, you know. He said he's the way, the truth and life. He's the way to the father that we lost. We lost the father when Adam fell. So he said, no one goes to the father except through me. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome back. Thank you so much for coming. We are learning about the process of dominion. So let me see. Multiply, fill the earth. Yeah, I think we, we entered with the fire fruit. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you, Father, for all the questions we have in our hearts about your kingdom, about life on the earth, about you, about what you intended to do, my God. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for the kingdom school. Thank you for the gospel of the kingdom, which will be preached. Jesus, you said, Matthew 24, 14, when this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, in all the nations as a witness, then the end will come. Lord, help us to fulfill that mandate, Jesus, you gave us to the church, to the ecclesia, to preach the gospel of the kingdom, Father. I thank you for what you're doing through us. 
and help us to partner with what you're doing on the earth today and deliver us from every lies and deceptions of the enemy. Holy Spirit of God, you're the spirit of truth. Thank you for leading us into truth. And, and we love you, we honor you, we bless you. Thank you for opening our hearts and our ears. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. You know, through this pandemic, you know, what God is doing is trying to open our eyes to the truth, to the reality of his kingdom. Because when I studied the New Testament, there is not a single mention of a church that, or it has to do with anything to do with the building. Jesus or the apostles never wrote about a physical building when they were talking about the church. The church is always a body, a governing body of God's kingdom on the earth, which can meet anywhere under a tree, in an airplane, on a ship, or in a house, or in a coffee shop. We can meet as an ecclesia. Jesus said where two or three are gathered in his name, he will come. Do you think Jesus keeps his word? <laughs> of course he does. He doesn't lie. So where two or three are gathered, he comes. But the question is, we don't know what to do with him when he comes. Because we are so stuck in our tradition and how God should work and how God should move. You know, we need, oh Lord, help me. If I tell you everything God put in me, you know, it will, it will blow our mind. So I had to hold back many of the things because you're not ready yet, like Jesus said. There's so much that I want to tell you, but you're not ready yet. So Jesus had to wait for to communicate with them everything he wants to tell them. He didn't tell them everything when he was on the earth. He said, I want to tell you so much more, but you're not ready yet. Because they were not prepared in their hearts, in their mind, in their spirit to receive what God had for them. So he had to wait. So that's why I say revelation is progressive. The moment we think we figured this out, we miss it. The moment we think we know it, we, be, we get stuck in religion. We have to keep moving. So we have been learning about the process of having dominion. God will never tell us to do something and, and not tell us how to do it. So he told us to have dominion. Then Genesis chapter 27 and 28, he gave us the process of dominion. So the first commandment he gave to us to be fruitful productive, what do we produce as Christians around the world? How many products we came up with? How many inventions did we come up with? We use and consume. The One of the powerful things God ever taught me was from Genesis 1.1. I don't know if I shared that story with you. In the beginning, God created the introduction of God to humanity is as the creator. He's the most creative person in the universe. There are two groups of people, producers and consumers. The church became the most consuming agency on this planet Earth. We don't produce much. We eat and use and consume what the world produces and make them rich with the money we have, then we come into the church and sing, the world is not my home. That is hypocrisy. We are supposed to be the most productive people on this planet Earth. That's what he told us. The first commandment is to be productive. Produce something with the potential resources that I have given you. Maximize the potential, the opportunity that have deposited into your mind, into your body, come up with a solution for the things that the world is suffering with. Come up with a product that is useful, an idea or a book or something that God has deposited in you because each of us carry the seed of God in us. We are a seed of God planted on the earth. We have been born again by the seed of God's word 
which will not destroy incorruptible seed. That seed has to become fruit. And to, to, for the seed to become fruit, it has to go through a process. But we don't like change. We resist change. We fight change at any cost. That's what happened to the Pharisees when Jesus showed up. The Messiah they waited for 4,000 years. The creator of the universe, God, came in human form, walked among them. They didn't recognize him because they were so stuck in their religious practices. And I don't want that to happen to any one of us. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want to miss God in the next season of my life. So that's what I shared my story with you. I had to throw everything I learned in religion and Christianity. I grew up in a religion called Pentecostalism, which taught me this world is not my home. This earth doesn't belong to us. Everything God put in here is, belongs to the devil and his children. And when I read the Bible for myself, I found out it's the opposite that I, that I see in the Bible. God created earth for mankind. He gave us the resources for mankind. He put the gold and silver and resources for mankind to use it to build and establish his kingdom. And that's what everybody else in the Bible did. So he said, be productive. How do we need to be productive? Our body needs to be productive. Our mind needs to be productive. Our, fr our spirit needs to bear fruit, fruit of the spirit, financial fruit. And once you have a fruit, once you become productive in one area, the next step is multiply. Everybody say multiply. Multiply. Multiply means to increase or mass produce something. You know, God gave me all these books. Those books came as a seed. They are products that God gave me. But if I just print one book, it's not going to help the people. I have to mass produce them, hundreds of them, thousands of them. I still keep making those books in my office here. Somebody comes and make those books for me. That is multiplication. Whatever God has given you, he wants us to multiply it. That's why the last parable Jesus shared in Luke chapter 19, just before he went to the cross, he said he gave talents. A nobleman went to a far country to receive a kingdom for himself. He called his servants and gave them his resources. And he told them, go and do business till I come back. What is business? Multiplying what God has given you. The products you have, the idea you have, the message you have, the song you have, whatever God has given you, maybe the ability to speak, ability to sing, something God has put in you, a seed. Nobody arrived on this planet Earth without a seed. Even that Nick Vijik or something, you know, the man who born in Australia without any limbs, he is making millions of dollars through real estate, public speaking, motivational speaker. Now he's starting a Christian bank, like somebody said. How does a man without a legs and hands do all those things? The seed is in him. Somebody say, I have the seed of God in me. Religion makes us, teaches us about excuses. Why we cannot be productive? We wrap it up, our talent God gave to us in a handkerchief, and we bury it. And been waiting for 2,000 years to be raptured out of this planet Earth when he told us, do business till I come back. Occupy till I come. And one day we have to give an account of, accounts of what he has given us. So multiply, that is the second step to becoming or having dominion. The third step is fill the earth. This means to distribute or market what God gave you. Every businesses, successful ventures on the earth, any successful ventures, businesses, they follow this principle from Genesis chapter 1. It's a, it's a trillion dollar idea. God put it there, but we missed it. 
but the people in the world is using it. The devil discovered God's kingdom principle and gave it to his children to become productive and successful in their field. He stole it from us. That's his job to steal, kill, and destroy. He steals what God gave to us by blinding us, lying to us. That's what he told in the beginning to Adam and Eve. What God gave you is not good enough. Who you are is not good enough. You have to do something to become like God. So the third step of having dominion is to fill the earth. That is the process I am in now. I am filling the earth with the message and these books God has given me. That is the stage I am in. Some of you are maybe still in the seed stage. That seed has to become productive. Then you move into multiplying it. Then you have to move the next step to fill the earth with what God has given you. How come you find a Pepsi or a Coca-Cola in every village on this planet earth? There may not be a road. There may not be electricity. But there is a Pepsi bottle there. There's a Coke that you can find. There's no shops. Maybe there's a, there's a roadside shop, but there's a Pepsi sign. You can see it. How did they do it? They filled the earth with their product. Marketing, which God said it in Genesis chapter 1. And this is what we should be teaching our children in Sunday school, not Kumbaya. This is what we should be teaching them how to do it. How to take dominion over this planet Earth. How to dominate the Earth and resources, not people. Fill the Earth. That's what he told them. And the next step is subdue it. What is subdue means? Do it like nobody else did it before. Everybody can dance, but Michael Jackson danced in ways that nobody else could. He subdued that art of dancing. <laughs> and everybody comes pay money to watch him dance. So when you do something like nobody else did it, people come and pay you to get your service. Doesn't matter what craziness it is. If you can do something like nobody else did it, People come and pay you for it. What if a violinist, one of the most famous violinists, sits on the roadside on the New York City by the railway station or the train station or the, what do they call it, uh, subway or something? What if he sits there and plays his violin? Nobody will recognize him, even though he plays the best music. But he has to be put in the right place for people to appreciate the value and the quality that he produces. Subdue means do it like what did Steve Jobs did. There was computer before, but he took that computer and made it like nobody else did it before. Or the phone that we have, cell phones we have, you know. What happened to Nokia company? What happened to, what is the other one? I forgot his name. So Steve Jobs took it to a new level and did it like nobody else did it before. He subdued it. What is that thing that's challenging you that you need to subdue it and do it like nobody else did? When you do that four steps, the result is dominion you will have dominion over one area of life that is the process of having dominion so put your hand on your head please and say be fruitful multiply fill the earth subdue it and have dominion i command products to come out of me ideas to come out of me, revelations to come out of me, solutions to come out of me. 
in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. So every morning for the next 20 days, you know what you should do when you go in the morning to the bathroom in the morning, put your hand on your head and say, be fruitful. Multiply, let products come out of me. Put your hand on your heart and say it five times a day and you will see the change. And you have dominion over something in the next five years. So each of those steps in the process of dominion is a business idea. See, for Pepsi to reach Zambian village of Choma, do you know how many steps that Pepsi has to go through? The water it contains, the sugar it contains, the poison it contains, the bottle they make, the cap and the paint and the packaging, the marketing. And for that to step there, each of those steps is a business idea. And somebody is taking advantage of it. Because they don't do it all by themselves. And even the box somebody make to package it, that's a business idea. And this is God's kingdom. <laughs> and while we are clapping our hands there, somebody is making a product in a nearby factory. Then we come and clap our hands next Sunday again. Lord have mercy, right? And we have been clapping hands for too long. And God is getting tired of it. And he said, I'm going to shut that religious place down for two years. And I want to see what you guys do with it. And I wish he will shut it down for another two more years. So we will wake up to the kingdom. And become the people of the kingdom. So the kingdom living. So what is God's plan for all eternity? As we're learning is to establish his kingdom. So that's how we started with Adam. He, created, he planted the garden, put him there. Then he said, multiply, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, have dominion. And they failed in their mission. God raised up another nation through Abraham called Israel. Israel is the pattern for every other nation. They, God wanted them to be light to the Gentiles. Light means blueprint. If you want to know how a nation is to be established, not the religious side of it. Religious spirit always like religious things. And we miss the pattern. The economy God established through them. The parenting that God established through them. We, we, we neglected all those that think God told the people of Israel and we become so religious. We put some, Lord have mercy again. <laughs> he put the pattern there, how an economy should work, how a relationship, the moral laws, everything a nation should follow, which is actually the foundation of the constitution of the entire world is the Mosaic law that God gave to the people of Israel. So when he brought them out of Egypt, God said in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, I want you to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God wanted them to be a kingdom, his kingdom. That's his plan. For Old Testament, New Testament, same thing. God doesn't have a new thing, new plan, new idea. Purpose remains the same methods changes as you learned in the rediscovering the lost kingdom so he told them you shall be to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation so the church is called a holy nation also first peter 2 9 but you are a chosen generation a kingdom of priests royal priesthood a holy nation the same phrase god used for the people of israel it's used for the church. The church supposed to function as a nation, not denomination. Just like the people of Israel functioned as a nation, we supposed to function as a nation. And as I told you, there are churches on the earth today that function as a nation. But to the outside world, they are known as religion. 
So his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvel of light. Church is a nation. Matthew 21, 43. Jesus said, therefore, I say to you, he is telling to the religious leaders, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Jesus came to give them the kingdom. They said they don't want it. And Jesus said, I'm going to take that from you and give it to another nation. Who is that nation? The church. Whatever a nation has, the church should have. Agriculture. We should have a farming businesses. Church should start farming business. We should have our own economy. Just like in the book of Acts, the first thing the early church established was economy. Not prophetic school, not healing school. It was the economy they established. That's God's pattern. The first thing God established in the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt was economy, not sacrifices. Educational system, kingdom educational system, apart from Babylonian system, we should have our own judicial system. Jesus said in Matthew 18, when two of you are having a problem, don't go to the court outside. Go to the ecclesia. Research and innovation. Every church should have a department of research and innovation. Wow. Can you imagine that? Churches are having a research and innovation, receiving the downloads from the Holy Spirit. What product and ideas he wants to release to planet Earth for the next 50 years. Seeing into the Spirit and preparing God's people about what is coming. Social and welfare. We are good at that. The church is majorly good at social and welfare system. Giving out free stuff. Kingdom health care. We don't have that yet. We need a kingdom health care system. Apart from this world's medicine that is killing people. Going back to our kingdom roots. God has made both Jew and Gentile one in Christ. For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as of you are baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. We are heirs of God. Everything he created. Joint heirs with Christ. Heirs of this world. Like we read in Romans 4. God made promised Abraham. To be the heir of this world. Now we are going to go to the next. Aspect of this course. Is discovering your calling. Now we have a comprehensive idea. About our purpose right. Why God put us here how to fulfill our purpose, please don't lose it. Don't let religion steal your purpose. When you go to the religious place next Sunday, they will tell you God created you to sing. Yet raise your hand and say, no, pastor, Genesis 1.26 says God created us to have dominion over this planet. And to fulfill that purpose, you have to discover your calling. So we all have same purpose, but different calling. So discovering your calling is the key to fulfilling your purpose. What is calling? Calling is an act of God to release you to fulfill your destiny or purpose in the kingdom. Once your purpose is established, once your identity is established, once your birthright in the kingdom is established, God will release you to fulfill your calling. Do not try to create an identity based on your calling or gift. Your identity has to be based on your relationship with your father as a son or a daughter. So what is a calling? Calling is an act of God. You don't call yourself into something. You don't put a title after your name. Saying I'm doctor or apostle or prophet or pastor. 
When I see in Africa, you know, one town has 200 apostles. God won't call in a single village 200 apostles. There may be one true apostle for the whole continent. There are only 12 apostles that Jesus called for the whole world. And Jesus said in Ephesians 4.11, he called some, not 2,000, not too many. Very few are called into the fivefold ministry gifts. Everybody who calls themselves a pastor is not called to be a pastor. That's their quitting. I hear in the news here in America all the time, 2,000 pastors quit every month. Or 5,000, I don't know how many thousands quit every month because they're doing something they were not called to do. They thought it's a profession to sustain, to support their family, to make a living. Your calling is not a means to make a living. It's a serious business. So what is a calling? Calling is the way of God to tell each individual the exact plan and assignment he has for them in the kingdom. Where do they fit in the kingdom? Are they called to be a hand? Are they called to be an eye? Are they called to be an ear? Are they called to be a mouthpiece of God? Whatever it is, God who picks and put those people in their places. God is the one who put this eye on my head. I didn't do it. He's the one who does that. He's the one who calls and anoints a person to do. And another definition is what is calling? Calling is the allotment from God to tell you in which area he wants you to work in his kingdom. Oh, I tried to do things that I wasn't called. My people of God, I can tell you, I almost killed myself under religion. I tried to build a ministry for myself to make a name and to make a fame. I wanted to have the biggest church. I did. But that was not what God has called me to do. <laughs> I am doing now what God has called me to do now, sitting here and teaching his kingdom and purpose to the nations of the world. What is calling your vision or dream or calling is God's way or system of providing for you in his kingdom. Your provision is attached to your calling in his kingdom. You don't do it for making money, but money comes to you as a result. So if you are saved, you are called. That's another misconception I had in my life. I said, oh, if God really called me, I had to wait for a burning bush experience or a Damascus road experience. Otherwise, I was not called because I was afraid. I wasn't sure. God may not send a burning bush experience. I didn't have a burning bush experience. All I had was an inner witness of the Holy Spirit in my heart, in my spirit man. What I, suppose, what I was supposed to do, and when he say to do something, I jump. Like I said before, when God asked me to jump, the only question I ask is, how high, Lord? <laughs> That's it. That's all it takes. Purpose is the same for all, but calling differs from person to person. There's no duplicates. There's no one. There's no two apostles on the earth that looks the same, do the same. There's no two prophets. Look at all the prophets God called in the Bible. They're all different. I say it's different from Jeremiah. Jeremiah is different from Ezekiel. Ezekiel, Ezekiel is different from Daniel. Daniel is different from Hosea. What they prophesied, how they prophesied, when they prophesied, it's different. Paul is different from Peter. Peter is different from James. But religion has produced duplicates. Everybody doing the same thing. And when somebody is doing something differently, we criticize them and we hit on their head and tell them to sit down. <laughs> and they lose their uniqueness and their assignment. 
second peter 1 verse 10 says therefore brethren be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things you will never stumble how do we not stumble never we have to make our calling what exactly what god called us to do and it takes like few years to figure that out it doesn't come that easy and your calling also unfolds in seasons in your life. You won't be doing the same thing all your life. So Peter is saying, make sure exactly what you're called to do and your election by God. Examples of calling. This is calling is different from purpose, okay? God calls you to do something to fulfill your purpose. Your purpose is to dominate the planet in different ways. David was called to be a king. Paul was called to be an apostle. Moses was called to be a deliverer. Joseph was called to be a prime minister. Esther was called to be a queen. Joseph of Arimathea was called to be a council member. Noah was called to build an ark. Abraham was called to be a nation builder. Their callings were different from person to person, but they all had same purpose. Dominate one aspect of life on the earth and establish God's will and his kingdom in that area. Or bring God's will on earth as it is in heaven. That's what they were doing. Not trying to take people out of this planet. We were called by God. When were we called by God? When we came to the church? When we were saved? Let's see what the Bible says. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 says, Who has saved us and called us? If you are saved, you are called. Everybody say, I'm called. But we just have to know what we are called to do. So who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works? That was another problem I had. I thought God would call me if I am so holy, walking in the cloud all the time. And if I miss one, then he canceled my calling. But not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. Every time Bible talks about purpose, it always talks about God's purpose, not our purpose. Because our purpose is the same. What's our purpose? His purpose is our purpose, which is to dominate the planet. All things work together for those who are called according to his purpose. There's only one purpose. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus, when? Before time began. So when did God call us? Before time began in eternity, when we were in the Father. That's when he called us. But he released us at certain point in time to this planet Earth according to the need this earth has. You arrived here because the earth needed you. This world needed you. That's why you landed here, whichever year you were born. So it's not a mistake. It's not an accident. God saw something in eternity. At particular time, this year, this place, this family, this person needs to be released. Boom! There comes Abraham John. But when he landed, he landed in this religious, ultra-holiness bondage. <laughs> and I had to shake that dust off and get into the kingdom. Thank God for his mercy. Otherwise, I would have waited and wasted my 80 years of my life on the earth serving Babylon, building the kingdom of darkness. And giving $10 to God's kingdom on Sunday morning. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. <laughs> wow. Before God formed us, he knew us because we existed before we arrived here. 
before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained to you as a prophet to the nation. So you landed here ordained. You just need to be recognized. Jesus said, I called you and ordained to you so you may go and bear fruit. But people need to recognize that. That's what happens through the fivefold ministry, recognition. The calling is already done by God. Apostles don't call you. Prophets don't call you. God is the one who calls you and ordains you. Sanctifies you. Who knows you. Romans 8 verse 30 says, Moreover whom he predestined, this he also called. Whom he called, this he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. This is all past tense. If you check the New Testament about our life, it's all talking about past tense, not future. You're already justified. You're already called. You're already saved. You're already glorified. You're already seated in Christ in the heavenly place, far above principalities and powers. When a person is walking in their assignment, no principalities can stop them. Maybe temporarily they might do something, but they, they are not powerful enough to cancel your calling and your assignment. They have no authority to cancel a, a child of God's assignment on the earth. No principality has the authority to do that. We can walk out of that by ourselves. We can, we can say we don't want it. God calls us according to his purpose, and we know that all things, I just said that word, verse Romans 8.28 says, we know all things work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. There is only one purpose. That is his purpose. Every time God creates something, he establishes his purpose. For the children not at being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. So 10 keys to discovering your calling. So these 10 keys are not exclusive. God can use a donkey to call you, to tell you what he called you to do. He can use a bird. But these are 10 keys that is mentioned in the Bible that God used. So number one is Holy Spirit. God poured out his Holy Spirit to anoint us, to empower us, to fulfill his purpose, not to make some noise. First Corinthians 2, 9 verse 12 says, Eye has not seen, ear hath not heard. Neither enter into the hearts of man what God has prepared for those who love him. But the next verse says, verse 10 says, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit. That is the purpose of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the things God freely gave to us. The earth, the resources, the anointing, the trees, the plants, the birds. The gold, the silver, the copper. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And if you say you have the Holy Spirit and you have no sense of purpose, then that's not the Holy Spirit. Desire of your heart. That's what I had when I was a child. When I was 13 years old, that's when this desire started coming to my heart of preaching. I used to receive thoughts ideas into my heart. I used to think, oh, this is a good thing if a, for a preacher to preach because I wanted to be an electronic engineer because I loved electronics naturally. But the destiny of my spirit was something different. So God put that desire in my heart. And when I was 18, I jumped. <laughs> I made a leap into the unknown. And God was there to catch me. G 
gifting and skills. What are the gifts, natural and spirit? We will learn about gifts in the next lesson, the last one next week. Gifts and skills. That's what God used in David's life to open the doors for him to reach the palace. One of the gifts he was practicing while he was feeding the sheep was how to shoot a stone on a sling and he became so good at it. And he used that opportunity while the sheep were taking nap in the afternoon, David was practicing his skill and practiced his music. So he reached the palace. Passion. What is the passion God has put in you? Not fleshly passion or selfish ambition. A passion to do something good for God's kingdom. That could be a sign of your calling. That's what Moses had in the beginning. And he stepped out, but he was not commissioned yet. And he killed an Egyptian. What makes you angry or grieved? Oh, the religious spirit made me so grieved and angry. When I was 21 years old, I wrote an essay in one of the organization. They asked me, write an essay about what you want to accomplish with your life. And that essay I wrote, I want to start a revolution in the church. Get God's people out of religion. And I didn't know how it was going to happen, how he was going to do it. But it was God's desire. Voice of God. Sometime God will come to you personally and call you just like he did Samuel. You hear his voice in your spirit man through his Holy Spirit. The other one is circumstances. Esther was caught up and became a queen. I don't think she was prepared for it or he was dreaming about it. But the circumstances showed up. I wasn't planning to start this kingdom school, but the circumstances showed up during pandemic. God said, start it. Your relationship, Peter, James, and John. Why did God call, Jesus called all those three brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John? They were all brothers. Sometime your relationship could be as God could open a door for you through the relationships you had, you have in your life. Provision. Where's your provision is coming from? I wanted to go to Dallas to Christ for Nations. God said, no, he brought me to Denver. Why? Because my provision was prepared for me here in a city called Denver that I never heard of in my life until I arrived here. <laughs> I never even heard that Denver exists. I know Dallas. I know Chicago. I know New York. I never heard of Denver. Dreams. Sometimes God can use dreams to speak to us like he did to Joseph. Many other people in the Bible Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Pharaoh had a dream. Joseph in the New Testament had a dream. God can speak to us through dreams, but all dreams are not from God. So we have to know. So those are the 10 keys that God uses to tell us what he's called to do. He may not tell you everything at this. If you, he will only show you the next step and you have to make that move. And when you get there, he will tell you what to do next. But we will wait until we get the whole complete roadmap and we never start to do anything. Or we get out to do something because it looks good or sound good or lucrative to make some money or something. Then we fall. So please watch this video about the calling. Some of you already might have seen it, but this is a, an interesting, exciting video. Question, what are you called to do? I ask that question because we won't be judged according to what we did in life, but rather what we were called to do in life. Imagine with me standing before the throne of God and a scenario like this occurred. Evangelist Anderson, come forth and give an account 
of your stewardship on earth. E evangelist Anderson, I, I'm not an evangelist. I, I, I'm an accountant. I, 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 I had an accounting firm. I had an evangelist Anderson. Where are the 347,566 souls I called you to impact in Asia, son? Where are they? I'm an, I'm an accountant. I, I had an accounting firm. I, I, I help churches. I help ministries with their, their, their finances. Son, where are the 347,566 souls in Asia I called you to impact? Son, where are they? Had you sought me, had you sought my face, I would have revealed this to you. Accountant Jones, step four and give an account of your stewardship. Uh, Accountant Jones? No, no, no. I, I passed up for 35 years. I, I, I had a, a membership of 750 people. Accountant Jones, I called you to the marketplace. Had you done this, you would have significantly impacted two people. You and those two men would have helped churches with their finances, and those churches would have impacted 751,321 souls. If you would have sought me, I, I would have revealed this to you. Sister Smith, come forth and give an account of your stewardship. I only raised three children. I, I never preached to, to nations. I, I never even been on a, a missionary trip. I, I only tried my hardest to raise my children in your way. Sister Smith, I never called you to preach to nations. I never called you to go to other countries on missionary trips. I called you to raise three children. And let me show you the 1,579,541 souls those three children impacted. You sought me, and you heard my voice. You were obedient to my call. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So remember, in regards to the calling that's on your life, you won't be judged according to what you did you will be judged according to what you were called to do. Wow. <laughs> that is something else, right? So next week when we come back, we are going to finish with discovering and mastering your gifts. So in calling, when you fulfill your calling, it doesn't have to be all dramatic something big out there in front of 5,000 people you know that's what we think of on the spotlight everybody knows about us maybe nobody knows about us like that mother that God has called to raise three children but that's what you're calling and calling is important whatever you're called to do it's like a body part our body is like the body of Christ some of the members of our body you can't even see them the heart, they're important, but you can't see them. Without that, you cannot be alive. So that's where some members in the body of Christ are. Everybody is not on the limelight, sitting in front of a screen, entertaining 10,000 people <laughs> or doing something, you know. 
So that is the importance of discovering what you are called to do. Maybe you're called to be a farmer. Who knows? An artist or a hairdresser. Whatever you're called, you have the freedom to function that call. Don't, make, don't let religion put you into a mold that calling is only preaching and teaching inside the church. Don't let that happen. Get out of that box. Get out of that mold. And be what God has created you to be. And function in that calling. So, Father, we thank you for this teaching. Thank you for this word. Thank you for enlightening, opening our eyes, delivering us from religion, from the mold of culture that put on us, Father. Thank you for revelation that causes revolution in our life. I thank you for transformation. Let this word sink deep in our hearts, Father. Let it not be taken by the enemy, stolen by the enemies. We will not slip back into religion again, but become everything, God, you have created us to be. I bless my brothers and sisters. I cancel every assignment of the enemy because of this word. I forbid the gates of hell causing any disruption in any way or possible in any of their lives. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus Christ's holy name. We pray and everybody said, Amen and Amen. Is everybody okay? <laughs> Any questions? Amen. Hello, guys out there in Zambia. I see you waving. <laughs> So any questions, comments, feedback from somebody said your calling is not a means to earn a living. Yeah, exactly. Yes, Holly, I see your hand. I have several questions. I don't know if you want to put all this on the recording, though. <laughs> well, let's try it if it is related to this teaching. Okay. In the New Testament, Hmm. It talks about apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and um, there's the, do you believe in the office of the apostle? Office. I think that we added that term office. A fossil is like a more like a function in the mm -hmm. body, you know? What so about when Paul said, there was a disagreement because he was calling himself an apostle and the disciples said, you're not an apostle. And he said, but I have seen the Lord face to face. And you have to have seen the Lord face to face to be called an apostle. No, he was definitely an apostle. Paul was an apostle. But there were those in the New Testament and the scriptures that said, you can't, he wasn't because he hadn't seen him. And that's why Paul came back and said, I am an apostle. Mm -hmm. So there were more than 12 apostles. There is. And there's apostles today. Okay. And you're, just, listening, and you're listening to one of them. <laughs> well, he's put into the church, the apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, and... Not everyone is an apostle, mm -hmm. but there are the fivefold ministry today existing. Absolutely. Without them, the church cannot function. I guess I maybe I misunderstood because you said there might only be one apostle per continent. No, no, no. I said I said when I go to Africa to a village i see 200 apostles with the business card they are not all apostles god won't appoint 200 apostles for a village or a town there might be one that is really called by god among those 200 everyone appoint themselves or call themselves that's what I said. I never, I didn't say there's no more apostles on the earth. They will be here as long as the church is on this planet earth. Okay. Without Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. <laughs> and 
if our calling is from God mm -hmm. and there was a laying out of hands in the New Testament, mm -hmm. what was the purpose for the laying out of hands? Recognizing what God has okay. called and commissioning them to do it. We only recognize what God calls. We don't call them. We don't call anybody to do anything. God did not give that authority to any minister. He's the one who calls. How do you handle the scripture that says, it seemed after Judas hung himself, the apostles mm -hmm. came together and prayed. Mm -hmm. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit to appoint another person as an apostle. Does it say it is good to the Holy Spirit? Well, I, I think they did that on their own. <laughs> they thought it was a good idea because they lost one. Maybe God was planning to call Paul to be the next one to replace that spot. Jesus didn't tell them to appoint another one. It was not their responsibility. Jesus is the one who called them, first of all, all those 12. So Jesus didn't tell them to replace another one because Judas was gone. So they thought that was a good idea. So they lost, they cast lots, you know, they wrote right. all the names and picked one. And he said, oh, okay, this is the one. <laughs> That's not how you appoint an apostle. By casting lots. You know, and if you don't hear about that person ever in the Bible, what happened to him? Where, what did he do? We don't hear nothing about him. But then we see Paul was called by Jesus. Maybe according to my opinion, maybe he was the one God wanted to put in that place where Judas was gone. That could be. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Because Holy Spirit hasn't arrived yet, so they have no clue about the Holy Spirit to, to think there's another place that that phrase is used. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and us to do something that was in Acts chapter 15 when they came together to discuss the problem they were having, the Jerusalem council. That's when they used that phrase, it seems good to us and the Holy Spirit, good to the Holy Spirit and us to do this, but not when they chose Matthias to replace Judas. They just thought it was a good idea, so they wrote a bunch of names and picked one. So if a person is called or is in apostolic um, organization, for mm. example. At what point does man pray and decide to designate uh, responsibility? And at what point does um, you say, well, we're going to wait for God to tell somebody he's an apostle? See, so it's like a confirmation you know you have to see to to form an apostle it takes years like a doctor to become a doctor how many years does it take 10 years or six years you know then you have to practice then you have to work under somebody for for some long practicing um to form a true apostle that's why i don't call myself an apostle this is the first time i'm saying in a screen that you are you are listening to one of them but people call me an apostle okay i never put that title why people call me an apostle because of the function and some places i go they call me an evangelist in india they call me a pastor <laughs> So, but I am not bothered by any of these titles. I, my thing is, am I fulfilling what I'm called to do? That's my thing. And what people want to call is up to them. My focus is fulfilling my assignment. I'm not looking for a title or identity or I'm not insecure anymore in that sense. I used to be insecure. <laughs> I'm not insecure anymore. So you're saying that a person who, one of the fivefold gifts, the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, mm. 
different anointings can come upon that person for different purposes or different seasons. Mm -hmm. And they, and God might use them in different ways the function of each one of those fivefold ministries, but they might not operate that for the majority of their life. Mm -hmm. It changes. That's why I said we don't do the same thing all our life in our calling. We will do different things in different seasons. That's what, what Jesus is the difference between the anointing of an apostle <laughs> and the, the office of the apostle. I think for me, I don't know what is this office. I think that's the term people came up with, like an office. We don't see such terms in the Bible. If somebody is called to be an apostle, you know, there's prof prophetic gift and prophets. That's different. But for an apostle, you know, the grace that is upon him is an apostle. That's it. Is an apostle one who puts things in order? And that's why the apostle and prophet are to establish the church. Yeah, they are the foundation of the church. They carry the blueprint. What needs to be done, what God is trying to accomplish on the earth. They, they reveal and release God's blueprint to the body, to the church. They lay the foundation, they establish us. They come with the blueprint. And they have to know about the kingdom. Every apostle know, needs to know about the kingdom. That's the first thing Jesus gave to the apostles. They're kingdom builders. But the kingdom has structure. Mm -hmm. Kingdom has structure. Kingdom has components, 12 components. Kingdom is a nation. It's a country. It's not an organization. It's not a denomination. It's not church. Kingdom is a country. God wants to bring it to earth from heaven. But a kingdom is organized. Yeah. Because yeah. it has administrative gifts that operate in it. Mm -hmm. It has administrative gifts, governing gifts. It has cleaning gifts. It has banking gifts. We need all the cooking gifts. <laughs> We need people to cook. That's also a gift. We need people to serve the table, just like in the early church, when the widows were not receiving their support. You know, they brought seven people, and Stephen and Barnabas was part of those seven people. The apostles laid hands and appointed to serve the table, and then they became evangelists and preachers. You know, that was the season. Then Stephen, we see him preaching. And he got killed. Barnabas went and called Saul that time to a soul. Then he became Paul. And he was the one who launched Paul into his ministry. Different functions. There's no box. We try to put in a box what happens and who does what. God's kingdom is, it's organized, but it's fluid it's flexible everything works like our body you know one cannot function without the other our hand two hands two legs two hands and all the veins and nerves that's just running through our each of them are important that's the way the body of christ is different members but one body so would you kind of define it rather than a railroad tracks that we have to go down a certain path to reach a certain day destination more like a river that's fluid it's both. <laughs> That's what I learned about God. God is never goes one, two, three. He goes like this, one, two, three, five. And then we go from one to three sometime, three to six sometime, and six to seven or five. We have to go with him. It's like a woman's brain. That's how God works. Man's brain is like box compartments. <laughs> Woman's brain is like, you know, zzz, they think about 100 things at the same time. They can answer the phone, take care of the baby, cook, and 
and do something else at the same time but a man is talking on the phone you don't talk to him anything else he he is stuck he cannot take care of the baby he cannot open the door <laughs> leave him alone until he's done with that talking that's the way man functions but a woman can do all those things at the same time that's how god functions <laughs> I'm not going to go there. You don't want to go there. Because <laughs> I'm in a ministry here. I'm not going to go there. Okay. That's fine. So I hope it clears or do you have more questions? Because I try to put God in a box. It doesn't work. He jumps out all the time. I, I understand that. I, I totally understand that. And he has an order. But his order is beyond our comprehension. You know, like in, in the New Testament, God, Paul wrote, our God is a God of order. Everything must be done in orderly fashion. But he didn't give us one, two, three, four steps there. Right. What's order? Pardon? I understand. But as a leader, it's yeah. not it's good what you're teaching because people need to be able to process the order god's yeah. order yeah so the order is because how do they fit with all these things that are happening even me by the spirit mm -hmm. scripturally how this, does this fit this understanding what they're called to do what is their calling and where do they fit which member of the body are they? Which part of the body are they? Are they a hand? Are they feet? Are they an eye? Are they an ear? But if the anointing comes on them hmm. and they're operating in apostolic and in the prophetic and in the teacher realm, anointing mm -hmm. by the power of the spirit flowing through them, mm -hmm. they could say, they need to be able to sort through what God is doing, but ultimately they just leave it up to God to do whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do it, whenever he wants to do it. <laughs> but it's good to understand the differences because there will people, people will come with strong, with, I don't, I don't know if I should use the word strong, but with a more of an, a calling in one area than another, and that could influence them to determine a, a direction in which they feel that they need to be mentored in or trained in. Mm -hmm. So it's important to emphasize seasons and um, diversity within how God uses you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Good teaching. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I see two other hands. Hi, Vince. Good to see you. Hey. Yeah. How you doing, uh, Mr. Abraham? Question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, teaching is awesome. Just like Ali just said. Oh man. I'm being transferred every time I transformation yeah, is going forth. Okay. So question. So you mentioned the gifts and callings, and like you said, here in your life, you heard people give you titles, evangelist, pastor, and uh, all the titles, and like you said, a apostle, um, apostle. Is that confirmation to you that you're doing what you need to be doing? And I say that because friends of mine, I kind of do little talk and things like that. And they say minister. I never went to a minister school. They say minister, minister. And I go, no, I'm, I'm not a minister. I've never been to a school or anything like that. So my question is, again, are those things that you recognize that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing when you hear those names? Mm -hmm. Elaborate. Yes. Okay. Just because I call somebody an apostle, they won't become an apostle. But I cannot pick somebody and lay hands on them and say, I'm going to appoint you or ordain you as an apostle. No, I can only recognize what God has put in them. 
or the function they are already functioning, then I say, oh, wow, this person is called to do this. So consistency is there now, not just one time doing something, but there is character, consistency, and the fruit that a person is producing. That needs to be recognized. Like Paul says, don't lay hands on anybody too soon. You know, just because once somebody does something like Holly said, the Spirit of God came upon somebody, somebody prayed and got healed. That doesn't mean that person is an evangelist now. That doesn't make that person an evangelist. God can use anybody to do anything. But he says he gave some. Jesus is the one who giving that gift, fivefold ministry gifts. And the church can only recognize it. And, and Paul, the church, like Holly said, the Corinthians church, the church that he planted began to doubt him because he was not like other apostles taking advantage of them and loading it over them. Right. And he said, I'm not going to do that. So they began to doubt him. Oh, is he really an apostle now? <laughs> because he's not enforcing his office over them to control them or to manage them. He said, you guys are the body. Be led by the Holy Spirit, what you're doing. And other people came in to take advantage of it and appointed themselves as leaders. And that's when that conflict came in the, in the Corinthian church. But he's the one who planted that church. He started it. But do you think that an apostle, through the gift of discernment, can see in the spirit realm and recognize the gifting that's in a person and then call that forth mm -hmm. because that person is asking the questions just like Vince is asking. Mm -hmm. And so an apostle, because the apostle establishes the order. Mm -hmm. And so the apostle can come and, and be praying with a person and the Lord can show them you are called into this and they call that forth. It might not be super specific, but it will call forth in the spirit realm, the gifting that God has placed in them. And then that person, for example, if you don't mind me using you as an example, can say, yes, that is what is the, my desire of my heart. That is what got my passion. And he, I, the apostle identifies that. That's what and it I, causes. It causes Vince to rise up and go, yes, no, I am more confident in moving in that area. Is that, that true? That's what I said. Again, the apostle recognizes what God put in that person. That person may not be aware of it. Yes. But the apostle sees it, recognizes mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. and acknowledges it, and mm -hmm. he establishes it. Mm -hmm. Gives them the opportunity to be able to experience it and move in the spirit. Mm -hmm. By that's what you mean by establishing, correct? Yeah, or establishing or releasing them into what God has called them. Gives them opportunity. Give them opportunity. Train them. Train them. Equip them. That's the fivefold ministry gives: equipping, training into whatever they are called to do in the ministry. Or ministry means not teaching, preaching all the time, like the whole thing we have been teaching is whatever God will call us to do. To be a prime minister, release them. Yes, uh, kingdom school. I, so Vince, did that, did that answer? Did that clarify what you were looking for? That's, again, that shares my thank you. You're welcome. Uh, if you guys, yes, uh, Apostle, thank you so much. This is Fred here. Yeah. Um, one student, uh, by the name of uh, Brother Elvis, Pastor Elvis, has a comment. But before he can come in, let me just also comment on the question of uh, apostleship. I believe uh, that um, an apostle is more of like an engineer where he knows who's supposed to function uh, in, a D, in a particular uh, place. So I, I believe that uh, an apostle who is called 
to lay a foundation, just like Apostle have explained, and uh, questioning really that uh, uh, who ordains an apostle. I really love the explanation that Apostle Abraham John you have actually given. Um, I believe to say an apostle recognizes people's gifts. That is why I want to encourage every student, uh, part of us, uh, every one of our students, to read that book. Uh, read this. I mean, uh, discovering purpose and calling. That book has really helped me to know because me myself actually, I was confused to say who am I? I thought I'm just a preacher. I thought I'm this. I thought I'm that. But the moment I begin to read the book and to listen to you, Apostle Abraham John, and I know who I am. I know now where I'm supposed to function. So an apostle is more like an engineer. He knows you know, where to put people to function in the kingdom. And there's no apostle who does not understand the message of sonship, the message of the kingdom. So any man who calls himself or herself an apostle, but does not understand the kingdom, does not understand sonship, that person is not an apostle because he doesn't understand, you know, what he must do. So for me, I believe that uh, all the explanations that you have given, to me, I believe that's a correct way of an apostle. Because so many people think that an apostle, it is somebody who has planted 100 churches. That one is an apostle. But I believe that an apostle can be somebody, he may not have a church, he may not have, have so many people, but the thing is the, the, the anointing, which is the ability to work, the, to do the, the empowerment, to do what has been called to do. So an apostle is somebody who is more like an engineer. He knows where to put an, an evangelist. He knows where, you know, uh, this, this person, whether he's a teacher, an apostle is there to lay the foundation. So me, I'm understanding you, Apostle, in a, a kingdom point of view. I believe that uh, in this time we are in now, God is called, he started with the apostles and he's ending with the apostles. He will not call the pastor, the pastor of function at his place. But now in this season, we actually need apostles to give us, you know, uh, direction. So thank you so much, Apostle. Let me give to uh, Pastor Elvis Chapfiali to also comment. Thank you. Hello. Yes, Elvis. Hello. Good, mm, gr greetings in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. <laughs> greetings. Hallelujah. Just sit, just sit. The teachings, yeah, I'm very happy of apostleship. I know apostleship is the people mm -hmm. who initiate, who start, who create. But what I, I want to encourage us is that, you know, you are shaping me. I'm knowing that, you know, apostles sometimes when season changes, also sometimes, you know, the vision changes. That is where I want to, you know, I've learned from you a lot, and I want to thank God for that. Amen. Because you can't, you know, work in a, the, you can't use the same pattern. Sometimes the, the season changes. Mm. You find even uh, the work itself changes. Amen. So I want to thank you very much for that, you know, because you are shaping me now. I am able to see that this season has changed. The first season I used to plant churches and uh, do what, uh, but this time it's extending even to other, you know, mm. I'm, 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 I'm too much on the kingdom. Not only on the church, the particular church mm. I was working. Amen. But this time I'm able to extend even to others, Hallelujah. With others in the kingdom. So thank God we are showing the pattern and I know where I'm going. Amen. He's been delivered from religion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Lord. Bless you, Elvis. Thank you for that testimony. May the Lord continue to shape you. To everything he wants you to be. Anybody else? Rex, do you have something? Or that was for the whole group. Or Simone, I see your hand. Hi, Abraham. I have a question. It's not something you touched on in your presentation, but it was part of the reading assignment, mm. um, specifically from the book the three most important decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering um, in with reference to your call and um, marriage, 
of finding um, your life's partner. Mm. Is it is it that for based on some people's call, it is necessary for them to be married in order um, to experience the fulfillment of it, or is that a decision that is is subject to the person or is it something that is inspired by the Holy Spirit? Because I know that not everyone, not everyone is called to marriage. Mm -hmm. um, some people are called to, to lead a single life for the sake of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering because um, sometimes you hear people say that, okay, um, God, God, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and, and told them that this person is to be their wife or this is the person they need to marry. Mm. Um, but is it something that the Holy Spirit tells you is necessary for you based on your call? Or is it something that is it something that 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 you decide? Because <laughs> I don't know if you can. Help, help me figure this out. <laughs> Thank God for all the singles. You know, somebody asked the other question. See, marriage, again, we cannot put God in a box. We cannot say, oh, you can only fulfill what you're called to do if you are married. You cannot say that. Or the opposite also is true, which says you can only fulfill what you're called to do if you're married or you should not marry every situation is different but if you choose to marry it is better to marry somebody who complements what you're called to do not competing or or nothing to do with each other you know the the purpose of marriage god brought adam and eve together was to complement woman was brought to do not to do what man was doing woman was brought to do something that man cannot do that's why god created them differently man cannot do what a woman can do and woman cannot do what a man can do they're different in their roles and their assignments and so like many people in the bible who fulfilled what they're called to do they were not married or you didn't see their wife with them so God didn't say, hey, where's your wife? Go and bring that. Then only I can use you in my kingdom. God never put such condition anywhere for anybody in the Bible. So marriage is our choice. Someone, someone is better not to be married, actually, like Paul says. He wants them to be like them. So he can focus on what God has called you to do and avoid all the troubles and the fights and the fuss in the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because marriage is not an easy thing. What you see from outside before you are married is not what you are going to face in real life when you are married. It's two different world. So we had to be very careful. Most people, they don't do this right. I would say like 98% don't do it right. They marry for the wrong reason because they were not educated in that area. They had all these unrealistic expectations and ideas what they saw in a movie. And then they tried to look for this person. That person doesn't exist, only in their mind they exist. This perfect person or the perfect woman or the perfect man. But then when they get married, then you have to deal with the real life and then you say, oh, my goodness, what do I do now? So you have to think about this. That's why that three most important decision book, that's a powerful book, right? That tells you, prepares you what you need to look for when you are deciding to get married. So, yes. Yeah. OK. Yes, Abraham. But just one quick thing. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I think um, some people perceive it that way based on what they read in Genesis that when God created Eve, he mm. gave Adam a wife. But the scripture doesn't say that. The scripture says that he gave him a helper. 
that was fit for him or mm -hmm. that was comparable to him. Mm -hmm. And the account actually says that when Adam, after God brought Eve to Adam, Adam was the one who said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. You know, so some people, um, they think because the institution of marriage took place at that time, they think it was that God actually, God is the one who initiated that. But the scripture doesn't say that God brought Eve to be a wife, but it just describes her as a helper that is fit for him and um, fit for him based on the assignment that God gave him in the kingdom. So um, I believe that is, a, that is one of the key components or that is one of the key parts of the criteria for seeking a, a life partner in, in marriage, that is. Yes, it was yeah. God's choice. God presented her to him and Adam is the one who made that choice. God didn't make the choice for Adam. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Rex, are you still there? Yeah, yes, yes, Apostle. So, uh, my sister has a question here. Hi, Apostle. Yes. I'm Brenda, one of the students in Kingdom Church. Welcome. Uh, my question is, uh, like here in Africa, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, like here in Africa, some of the pastors impart, impart gifts. Is it from God or from man? That's my question. Pastors do what? I didn't hear you. Pastors give gifts? Pastors give gift to I'm who? I'm saying here in Africa, some of the pastors impart gifts. Is oh, it from God gifts. or from man? Okay, okay. Impartation, oh. laying of hands on, on a person. Is it from God or from man? You know, <laughs> you already have oh. gifts. You know, God is God already gives you gifts, but you can Somebody can stir up the gift. Sometimes somebody can give a gift, but that doesn't make you an apostle or an evangelist or a pastor. You know what I mean? You don't go after gifts. That's what we're going to learn next week. In the church, we were trained to go after gift first. That's the opposite. He's supposed to be going after purpose first. Then the calling, then the gifts will manifest. Whatever gifts that you need, it will manifest when you operate in the calling that God has placed in you. You don't need to go after a pastor to receive any gift from him or her. No, but impartation can happen. I'm not against impartation. You know, Paul also said to Timothy, the gift that has been imparted to you by laying hands of the presbytery. He says that in 1 Timothy. But what we emphasize is fulfilling the purpose because Jesus said many will come at the end. In Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to mute you so the background noise will be Okay, so Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus said, many will come at the last day, will come and tell me, Lord, we cast out demons, we prophesied, we did many wonders in your name. And what did Jesus say? Oh, you're so wonderful. You did all this miraculous thing for me and established churches of water. He said, I never knew you, you rascals. You break the law lawlessness they do not understand god's order the law what is the law It's not the old testament law the law that governs his kingdom purpose is the is the number one then calling then the gifts we don't go after gifts it will destroy your life at the end 
you can have a gift that doesn't make you anything in God's kingdom. It makes you attractive to people in front of people to build a ministry. But at the end, it may not be good for us. <laughs> so I don't encourage people to go after gifts. You know, once you understand God's purpose and discover your calling, like I thought I was not good in music. I was not good in sports. I didn't have any gifts. But when I recognized my calling began to function, that calling gifts began to manifest left and right. I didn't have to go after anybody to give me any gifts. God gave me five different kinds of gifts that we are going to learn next week. And it's all in you. Everybody has a gift. That's what we're going to learn next week. Well, thank you so much. God bless you. Please watch this video again. Um, next week is the last lesson for this class. So if this course has blessed you, as I usually ask, you know, please send me a testimony, either written or on a phone, like an one minute video. My hero is there, my Nikki, you know, she sent this video and we made a video now. It has reached worldwide. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki, for sending that video. So make it one minute video or five minute. You can say whatever you want, how this course has blessed you, changed you, transformed you, or challenged you. And the second favor is please introduce the Kingdom School to two other people. The registration for the next courses has started um, May 9th. That's when we start the next semester. So please introduce two friends, minimum two friends, all family members. You can send 10 or the whole town. I will teach them about the kingdom. But at least two, you introduce the kingdom school because I'm teaching this course for free. That's the favor I ask you. So thank you so much. Think about it. I will see you next week. Blessings to you. Have a great week. Bye-bye.